Sorry? Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for the time to uh, take off the time to come over all the way here to our city communes campus today. And uh, of course, we have our live streaming. Thank you for your time to be with us today. Uh, first of all, okay, let me introduce myself. My name is Sam. I'm the manager for uh, our higher education uh, division in Training Vision Institute. So I have over 10 years of working experience in uh, higher education and operations where uh, advising learners on what course to do, what's next, and how to do it, and so forth. So Training Vision has been uh, in Singapore for over 30 years. In fact, this year, we are uh, celebrating our 30 year anniversary. Training Vision is an approved training organization uh, by Skill Future Singapore for WSQ courses, as we all know. And Training Vision is also an AJU Trust four years uh, higher education institute by Committee of Private Education in Singapore. We have already trained over 100,000 learners for the past years, and yet we are still counting on right now. We have over 700 over corporate companies, MNC or SME, who have trusted TBI to upskill their staff from time to time. And we have five training campuses in island-wide to offer to our, uh, our learners, as well as we have over 100 certified faculty courses for our learners to choose as well. As well as we are partnering with nine different university institutes, partnership for education excellence. So as you can see from here, we do partner with EC Council, Boston University, Digital Marketing Institute, Excelsior College, of course today, RHT Academy, Cambridge College, Pepperdine University, SMU, Pasfa University. So these are the brands that have been trusted TBI to upskill their staff from time to time. As well, you're familiar with like Singapore Airlines, MOF, ITE, St. Luke, NUS, other care, and so forth. So TBI, as I mentioned, we our HQ are actually based in Jurong East, in Jam, in the MND tower itself which looks like this. Of course, we are now right now in the Kete, our city commune campus over here, Tampines, Hogan, and Woodland itself. Right now, let me show you our past graduation ceremony for your view. Turn toward me and look so weak. I've never seen you with such tired eyes. And everything we said we'd be, we just traded for a suit coat and a tie. From underneath the rose of trees, I will see you where the ocean meets the sky. Your toes, fire grows. You are ready for a different kind of life. You sign it for the wind is cold. You must return to the wild. You sign it for the wind is cold. You must return to the wild. wild, wild, wild. Follow me down, there's no one around. Lay back and take your socks and shoes right off. That natural light is so damn polite, can make you feel just like you were young. Again, oh, 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 oh. So 
Standing underneath the rows of trees I can see where the ocean meets the sky Under our clothes, the fire grows We are ready for this life of running wild We're running wild Underneath the rows of trees I will see where the ocean meets the sky Under your toes, the fire grows you are ready for a different kind of life. The sun is cold, the wind is cold. You must winter into the wild. The sun is cold, the wind is cold. You must winter into the wild. wild, wild. Uh, without further ado, let me introduce Mr. Yang, who is a practitioner, a legal practitioner, who's going to talk about the company and partnerships today. Okay. Thank you, Sam. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, taking the time to come here. And I know it's um, most of you are probably you know coming straight from work, so we appreciate the time you take to come here just to uh, listen to us uh, give this presentation. Um, so I think you've heard about uh, what TVI does and over at RHT, RHT is a law firm uh, and uh, we have partnered with TVI to offer this uh, diploma in Singapore law program. Sam will talk more about it later. But I believe that um, they sort of advertise me because uh, I'm, I'm actually a corporate lawyer. So um, I thought it'd be because I actually will be one of the trainers also in the program. Later on, you'll see the rest of the trainers as well, their profiles. But uh, the area that I specialize in actually is in corporate law. Corporate law, corporate finance. Most of my clients are companies. Some people, but of course, um, those who are wanting to do business, raise money, or enter into joint ventures with other people, and all of that come to me. I don't do divorce cases. And uh, Langa cases, I don't do that. Well, some of my other colleagues do that. You'll see that later on. So um, what we are going to cover today is basically an introduction to company and partnership law. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this area. I mean, unless you are also, you know, maybe some of you are professionals, like accountants or tax advisors or, you know, uh, people like that would actually already have uh, some knowledge of this but i think most people when they encounter the law usually it relates to for example real estate you know um, those of you in the property field or maybe when it comes to wills and estate planning perhaps you know so it's not an area that um, most people touch unless you're a business person but i think some of you here um, are looking to become professional advisors and what you will see is that your clients, I think, are often people who are doing these things. And therefore, you will need to advise them or have some knowledge about this area so that you can advise them. So, well, firstly, I think Singapore itself leverages on itself. I think EDB does a fantastic job all over the world to attract businesses to come here. And once businesses and MNC set up here, they will need a whole ecosystem of professional advisors and corporate service providers. And I think that's where some of you may come in in the future. So um, some knowledge of this area of law um, for them and for yourself uh, will be very useful. Um, you know, how, what are the best corporate structures to carry out the business plans? What are some things they need to watch out for? And then to, do they need to know their rights and obligations vis-a-vis joint venture partners or they're doing a sale and purchase, you know, with the counterparty. So basically the, the, the corporate and partnership law module, which is one of the modules in the course, 
is intended to provide an understanding of the corporate ecosystem. And it's either beneficial to those who are looking at setting up uh, your own businesses or those who will be advising people or who will be setting up their businesses. Okay, so what are we going to cover uh, in the course? Uh, and today is just a, a snapshot, a flavor of some of the things uh, that will be covered. Um, so actually that um, diagram there is more useful. So uh, we start from the beginning all the way to the end, right? We start with the constitution of companies, of partnerships. We will talk about corporate governance. You hear that term a lot uh, these days, corporate governance. Everything is about governance. 20, 30 years ago, nobody really cared much about it. But today, I think governance is one of the things that um, is just, you know, the a buzzword that you hear all the time together with terms like, for example, sustainability. That's another term that you hear quite often, right? Um, so you start with the incorporation of a company, right? And then, you know, a company will have share capital. You learn about separate legal entities. We'll talk a bit about that uh, here. Shareholders and members, their rights and obligations, directors. I think a lot of people under this conception or misconception that being a director of a company is a great thing to be, you know, I'm a director, you know, but it comes with a lot of duties and responsibilities. So it's, it's very good for you to know these because um, a lot of people get, get themselves into trouble because sometimes they're just not watching the business and the person actually running it, uh, you know, gets the company into trouble. But when the law comes after you, they look at all directors equally. All directors are at law equally culpable. Of course, the punishment that the authorities that might met out on the different types of directors may be different. Some are more culpable than others. But at law, all direct directors have a fiduciary responsibility to the company and to shareholders. And that fiduciary responsibility is the same. Um, then, of course, at the other end of it, um, you know, when companies come to an end, uh, how to wind them up, how to dissolve them. Some of them maybe can be rescued. So we talked about, about corporate rescue. And um, one of my areas of speciality, in fact, because I deal a lot with public companies and companies that are going public, so it will, the course will also cover the SGX listing rules. Um, the reason why this is um, important is I think some of you might be looking to, for example, become company secretaries, right? So once that happens, um, you find that in the board of directors, unless you've got another lawyer on the board, if not, all the directors will probably look to you to advise them on their duties and certainly the listing rules. And you can't always say, uh, I don't know, I need to go and consult a lawyer, I need to go and check and all that. You need to know the listing rules at the top, at the tip of your fingers, if your client is a public listed company. Okay, so yeah, so I just covered that. Um, so, uh, who, who is the intended audience for this course? Business owners, investors. I mean, some of you may be in a privileged position where you may be a professional investor. You kind of need to know how to invest. I mean, if the, if the company tells you, okay, I'll issue you shares, I'll issue you preference shares, i issue a bond, i issue a convertible bond, i issue a warrant, or, you know, you can take part in our rights issues. What, what do all these things mean? What do they give you? So you need to know what all these terms are. Um, of course, entrepreneurs, you've got a business idea you want to set up, but you need a vehicle. So what vehicle will suit you best? Depends on your business, depends on yourself. You know, uh, do you want to be shielded from liability from the business? Or you say not necessary, you know, I, I don't mind being uh, one and the same with my business. So we'll talk a bit, in fact, today about some of the different models, corporate models that you can adopt. If you're a director, you should know your duties and liabilities. If you're a paralegal working in a law firm, uh, quite often, again, you're the first part of call. You need to have some basic knowledge uh, of uh, the law in this area. And of course, the last one I mentioned before, if you're aspiring to be a company secretary, um, then definitely um, you need to know a lot of these things. Um, and particularly if you're going to be a company secretary for public listed companies, actually um, this whole body of, of law that you actually do need to, or rules that you need to know. 
So, um, well, I hope this is uh, still accurate. I think Sam would know better in terms of the exact cost details. Uh, but of course, uh, I'll, I'll let Sam uh, that. cover that uh, later. So I should stick to what I'm good at. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so um, types of corporate structures, right? You can have companies, partnerships, sole proprietorships. Um, again, companies are different types. They're private limited companies, which is the vast majority of companies. Um, exempt private companies are companies which are very small. You know, you have no corporate shareholders, it's just a person. They're exempted from certain filing requirements with APRA, which is our company's registry. Of course, I mentioned public listed companies. There are also public unlisted companies. And um, why, why are there these creatures? Because a, pub, a private company can have a max of only 20 shareholders. So if you bust that limit, you have to convert to a public company. Uh, but at the same time, you may not be ready for listing on the SGX. So you're a public unlisted company. Uh, there are also these creatures called company limited by guarantee. We'll talk a bit more about that later. In fact, you'll be, I think it was just in today's newspaper, the front page. We'll talk a bit about that. Um, then we will cover some of partnerships. Um, in the old days, there's only one kind of partnership, which is a normal general partnership. But over the years, um, the last couple of decades, uh, two new creatures were created called the limited partnership and a limited liability partnership. Uh, and we'll talk a bit about that. The last one is a sole proprietorship, which is actually the same. It's just a trading name that you adopt. Uh, it's no different from you as a person. There's no separate legal personality. Okay. So this you hear this a lot, separate legal. Why do people set up companies in the first place? I think quite often the main reason is to separate themselves from the business. So if they're not personally liable for the liabilities and obligations of the company and that there's also a limit to how much like your your liability is pretty much capped to the amount of capital you put into the company so um this separate legal personality has its users because the company then becomes a legal person just like human being we are called natural persons a company is a legal person you know? So the company can sue and be sued and own property, can dispose of property, buy property, is separate from the shareholders of the company. So again, as I mentioned, there's a cap on the liability because it's pretty much capped to the amount of capital you put in. The most you can lose is that, uh, you know, unless you go and give a personal guarantee or something like that. If not, uh, you know, the creditors and all that, they cannot come up to you personally. So that's part of the beauty of having a company, right? And also lastly, it enjoys perpetual succession because it can survive the human being. So if you want to pass the business down to your children or to successors, the company keeps going on. Of course, the shares in the company get transferred to people, but the company goes on forever, indefinitely, in theory, unless it is wound up or struck off, okay? So the most common kind of company is one that's limited by shares, right? So a private company will tend to have a restriction on the right to transfer shares. Sometimes, in fact, often, you have what you call preemption rights. So you cannot freely transfer the shares. Uh, you have to um, offer it to your existing shareholders first and say, do you want to buy before you can transfer to the outsiders? Um, yeah, sorry, I mentioned uh, earlier, there's a limit on the numbers. Uh, now it's uh, 50 people. So it's a bit more generous. Um, beyond that, you need to com uh, convert into a public company. Uh, I mentioned the limited liability and separate personality. And you are limited by the amount of capital you put in. That's your liability, right? The, the creditors cannot ask you to pump more money into the company if you already paid up for your shares in full. So the worst case scenario, you lose your investment. But that's about it. Okay, A public company um it's the same except that it can have more than 50 members and it can raise capital by capping the public markets the capital markets um so of course because it can do that it is going to be subject to more much more regulation than a private company okay so it's the opportunity cost of raising money from the public so a public listed company 
is one that's listed on the Singapore exchange or any other exchange. It's still called listed company. If you're listed on NASDAQ, uh, it's a listed company. You're listed on Bursa Malaysia, it's a listed company. Okay. Uh, listed companies in Singapore are subject, of course, to the SGX uh, Reg Code, which is the regulatory body that regulates uh, public listed companies if you're listed on the SGX. Okay. And also, then I think some of you may have heard this term before uh, the Code of Corporate Governance. So corporate governance is codified now into a code. So it's not just airy fairy stuff. I mean, now, um, you know, uh, through successive iterations, uh, we have a pretty uh, robust code of corporate governance now that if you're a public listed company, you must adhere to this. Okay. Uh, I mentioned earlier about public unlisted companies. These are not listed on the stock exchange, but you can have an unlimited number of uh, shareholders. Uh, this creature, company limited by guarantee. Um, previously, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not so common. There are not many, the vast majority are companies limited by shares. Um, many of these are actually um, either not-for-profit organizations or charities, right? So there, there are companies that do not have a share capital. It does have limited liability and separate legal personality usually used to carry out not-for-profit activities, okay? Um, again, uh, there's limited liability even though there are no shares. They call it limited by guarantee because there is people who will guarantee the company. So the limit to the liability is actually the limit of the guarantor's guarantee to the company. So that is um, um, why it's called company limited by guarantee. Uh, CLGs cannot pay dividends because it actually doesn't make profit. So it is not really suitable for a money-making enterprise. Usually you don't use a company limited by guarantee. Use it limited by shares uh, because you can make profits, declare dividends and all that. Again, most of these are usually for not for profit or charitable organizations. Uh, they are uh, liable to corporate tax like any other uh, uh, company, unless you're awarded charity status, then of course uh, you could possibly be tax exempt. So I mentioned earlier that um, usually not heard of much, except that today front page in the papers, uh, as you know, SPH gave a press conference yesterday evening uh, to say that they're actually going to hive off the media business entirely into a company limited by guarantee because you know, the media business has not been profit making for many years now. So I think now they decide to bite the bullet and the rest of the other entities of SPH are profitable. So every year they have to answer shareholders, you know, like why, you know, is, you know, this past profitable, but the media is always dragging people, you know, dragging the company down. So I think they've decided now to hive it off to a company limit by guarantee uh, so that the rest of the business is profitable and continue. And this one will then just focus in a way, on its core objective, which is to provide media coverage, right? They, are, they run uh, most of our primary newspapers in Singapore. So, um, so this term, in fact, um, now more people have heard of it. I won't be surprised if you'll start asking me, so, so what's this creature called, CLG? Um, what does it do? So it's kind of come up to the um, top of people's uh, mind now. Also, I mentioned earlier about corporate governance. Basically, corporate governance, there's certain Four principles here, transparency, accountability, integrity, fairness, sustainability, diversity, capability, and leadership. Um, the Code of Corporate Governance, that will be a lecture in itself. And in fact, if you sign up for the course, there'll be a module that covers the entire Code of Corporate Governance. Um, but obviously, we don't have the time to talk about uh, more of that uh, today. Uh, a company is... The, the constitutive document is called the constitution. It used to be called the memorandum and articles of association, the MA of a company, but they changed it uh, to a constitution some years back. In fact, by law, they changed it. So even if you don't amend your articles, MA, it is still called a uh, constitution from now on. Right? But we always advise our clients, you know, we should align yourself with the changes to the Companies Act. So go and amend your articles. So, you know, I mean, sometimes uh, if you're a company secretary, just by this change alone, 
it generates a lot of work for you, you know, in a good way, because all your companies will have to go and change their M&A into constitution. Of course, by now, many may have missed the boat because they have been done over the last few years. But uh, there could still be some who, you know, old companies who have just not bothered. Um, they might suddenly wake up and say, I need to change my constitution and give you some fee paying work. Okay. So this basically uh, governs the uh, relationship between the members, the shareholders inter se, and with the company. And of course, the directors, as I mentioned earlier, directors have a lot of duties. Some duties are imposed by the Companies Act. Okay, so like Section 156 of the Companies Act, Section 157 of the Companies Act. Um, some are encapsulated in what we call common law. Singapore being, uh, I mean, we are a former British colony, colony. Um, we are part of the Commonwealth. So our system of law is called what we call common law, which is derived from the UK, obviously. Um, so all your former British colonies, most of them would be common law countries, as opposed to countries that were say colonies of the continental European countries. All the continental European countries themselves, they are governed by what we call a civil law system. So the world is roughly divided into two systems of law broadly. So countries like Singapore, <coughs> countries of course the UK and the United States are all under the common law system. All your European countries and all their former colonies will be governed under the civil law system. So under common law, you have certain duties uh, that you need to adhere to. And this is built up over the last two, 300 years longer. So if you're a director, it's good that you know what your duties are and what your fiduciary obligations uh, to your company are. So it's not just a position where you sit there and collect director's fees every quarter. You have rights and obligations. So these are some of the things that can happen to you if you breach your fiduciary duties, um, including if you made some ill-gotten profits, you got to cough it up. So I said, there's this thing about limited liability, and all that is true. In fact, a director may not even be a shareholder. But for example, if he acted in a way that benefited himself at the expense of the company, if the company finds out and they can take him to court, sue him, and recover all those gains that he made at the expense of the company, so directors uh, come with a lot of responsibility. Okay, so I think I've covered uh, companies. Now I've talked a little bit about partnerships. Okay. Uh, the classic partnership is just a general partnership. There's no separate legal entity. Um, it is one with the partners. Uh, the partners collectively own the assets of a partnership and um, each partner is individually liable for the debts and liabilities of the partnership. The partners uh, usually will be between 2 and 20, um, and they can be either individuals, bodies, corporate, and other companies can also be partners. Um, the partnership is constituted by a partnership uh, uh, agreement, usually, uh, and then we have a statute called Partnership Act that governs it, but it is nowhere near as thick and comprehensive or prescriptive as the Companies Act. I mean, the Companies Act is about this thick, the Partnership Act is about this thick. So it's, it's quite a free for all. Um, not a favorite corporate vehicle, partly because there's no separation between you and the partnership. So um, sometimes it's suitable, but uh, often it is not. Then in recent years, um, the law came in to create some other uh, uh, hybrid entities. Uh, the first of which was what we call limited partnership. I think those of you who uh, do funds work, those of you who investment funds, for example, you would have heard of this term because, again, we didn't invent this. Singapore, you know, quite often we borrow the best ideas, we make it our own, but we don't invent things from scratch. Not, not efficient. Why, why we want to do that? Uh, so the limited partnership has been around in other jurisdictions for a long time. It only came to Singapore recently. But you would have heard this term, GPLP, General Partner, limited partner. Usually the GP are the people who set up the fund for investment. The limited partners are the investors who come in. So we wanted our own. 
So we also, under the Limited Partnerships Act, created this so that we are more friendly for fund formation here in Singapore. Later on, I'll go on to talk about something that makes us even more friendly. And I think with that, we really took the battle uh, to some of these other favorite jurisdictions where funds are set up. So I'll leave that for the last. And limited liability partnership. Now, limited liability partnership, uh, as the name suggests, has a separate legal entity from that of its partners and it has perpetual succession. Um, that's the big distinction. It's, in fact, this turns it closer to a company. There's only one big difference, which I'll go on uh, further down there, but it can own property, sue and be sued in its own name. Um, you'll find there are a lot of professional services outfits, like law firms, like accounting firms. A lot of them actually like this model. Um, they like it because um, it has some of the benefits of a partnership, but separate um, legal personality, so there's a limit to the liability. The big difference between a company and an LLP is actually on tax. Uh, an LLP uh, is that the taxation is that of the partners. That means it's not of the, it's unlike a company, a company with corporate tax, right? And as uh, shareholders, you don't get taxed. Um, but for profits that are made, but here, LP, you're, you're taxed at your own individual uh, tax rate. So it's tax transparent in that sense. But yet they're separate legal personality. So um, you find a lot of professional services firms like to use this model. Okay. A sole proprietorship really is, um, it's just, you're really small. You're just running a business. You don't need a separate legal personality. Uh, you know, you're, it's just you. It's just your alter ego. Uh, you just register a trade name, basically, you know. So sometimes you see this term, so and so T A trading as, you know, fancy goods or something like that. Uh, that then it's very telling because you will not see a P T E L T D behind it. So sometimes, in fact, when you deal with with um, people, and they come to you to give you the business card, right? And you know, you're buying something or want to do business with them. You look at the card. It says something something, right? Um, of course, sometimes it's just a card. They don't put the full name with the PTLTD. But if that is the full legal name, then it's very telling. In other words, you're not dealing with a company. The guy might think it's a company, but you're actually dealing just with the person. So you gotta, then you got to look at this person, what he's worth. You know, if you want to do business with him, how much is he worth? Right? Um, because it's not a separate uh, legal entity. Okay, the last thing I'm going to talk about is something which is brand new, hot off the press, I mean, last two years maybe. This, I mentioned something about, for example, for fund formation that really takes the battle to uh, jurisdictions like Cayman Islands, which is a favorite jurisdiction for setting up investment funds. So we, Singapore, wanted a piece of the action. So we promulgated our own VCC Act. Uh, in fact, they only started um, at the beginning of last year. So in Cayman Islands, they've, they've been having this creature called an SPC for the longest time, right? Which allows them, it's called segregated portfolio company, which allows them to set up a fund with distinct pockets or sub funds where uh, you can actually put different investments in there and they are all shielded from each other. So one investment, if it goes bad, doesn't infect the others. So, um, I mean, it's, it's great for investment structure. Uh, all this within one vehicle. So we decided that we wanted our own. So we promulgated the VCC Act. And then, so now, in fact, in the last 18 months or so, uh, this has been very um, increasingly popular. As of now, there are about well over 200 uh, VCCs that have been set up in Singapore already. And in fact, at, at our firm, you know, we're getting an increasing number of inquiries, but a lot from overseas, you know, coming in saying, I want to set up a VCC uh, because they find this investment structure very attractive. Okay. So it's a separate legal personality. And the only thing, though, is that in Singapore, um, Singapore MAS being what it is, they say, if you want to do this and manage other people's money, through a VCC, you must appoint a licensed fund manager, licensed by MES, to manage it. Um, 
you, you can't sort of just do it on your own. So you need to either get your own license or engage a licensed fund house to manage the VCC. That in itself has created work for fund managers in Singapore. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good development. Uh, and what they're trying to, the government is trying to do is attract foreign funds. They allow foreign funds to re-domicile itself in Singapore as a VCC. So instead of being a Cayman Islands SPC or Bermuda fund, you know, BVI fund uh, or Luxembourg fund, right? Uh, they say, you know, come to Singapore, use a VCC structure and, and so all the money comes here instead. So I think that's a, quite a lot of foresight on the part of the Singapore government. Uh, okay, so actually these are just some of the other features of the VCC. But again, uh, you know, if you if you go for the course and all that, um, we, we can talk more about about you know what what makes the VCC very attractive. Okay, I think that is in fact all that uh, I have. Uh, of course, if you have um, any questions uh, so far you have any questions you want to bring up regarding on the topics that uh mr young have just delivered over yeah you, you, you can on. yeah you can you can i'm happy to take questions now uh, alternatively I, we can take questions uh, at the end of sure. the session as well maybe right. give you some time to think of <laughs> some questions so i'll pass it back to sam to talk more about the course that we're running all right so what we are here today is basically to also to understand about the Diploma in Paralegal Studies that is being offered by the TBI and in partnership together with RHD Academy. So of course, like what Mr. Yang has already introduced to you guys, what is uh, where, where RHD come from and RHD Academy as well. Well, Diploma Paralegal Studies. So Diploma Paralegal Studies is, consists of nine modules, which is a blended learning and you will learn it in a part-time basis over the eight months course for those target audience again like what mr young have just shared with everyone for those who would like to be functioned as a qualified paralegals personnel pursuing career in the legal environment it could be some of you who are in the corporate world right now who wanted to know more about this paralegal as well to understand the singapore legal system so what are the nine modules that we are looking at? So these are the nine modules that we are looking at. Legal fundamentals, criminal law, civil procedures, family law, company and partnership, which is Mr. Young have just mentioned just now, corporate secretarial practice, convincing law and procedure, preparing bills for taxation, intellectual property law. So these are the nine modules that you will cover for this whole eight months program. These are the trainers who is, who is also a practitioner in the markets are qualified to train this whole program by their expertise. So what are the key benefits we are looking at? So this program itself, it will be 100% online learning and the lessons are being taught by the legal practitioners like Mr. Young himself. So this is a very small class uh, environment. One tutor is to 25 maximum. In the classroom. The assessment will be carried out on each module on assignment basis, group presentations, case study, MCQ, and written exam for every module. So, what are the investments that you are looking at? So, this whole eight months program, okay, you will cost at $9,391, which TVI have taken into consideration on breaking it into three installments. So the first installment when you come in and then the third module when you're doing and the sixth module you're doing. So you will divide it into three installments. And because today you have attended and those who are wooing us over the live streaming, we are waiving off the application fee for those who would like to sign up within this uh, event itself or who have spoken to our consultant after this. The next intake will be on the 24th of May on every Monday and Thursday classes. So the classes will be conducted over Zoom evening classes. 
As I mentioned just now, these classes are basically they are blended learning. What is blended learning? So blended learning is talking about you, we do have an e-learning system where you need to log in and learn yourself on the materials that is being given to you, and then you will follow up with a tutorial classes by like Mr. Yang himself. So that he can hold your hand and go through all the courses that you are going through. While you are learning yourself, there are my questions that pop up that you do not understand that you ask during the class itself on the tutorial, uh, according to the schedule itself. So that's what we call blended learning. So you study first, go into the class, go through what uh, the tutor will deliver to you, and also the ask question so that Every one of us who are adults, uh, learner who goes in, we don't go in in the brand mind. So that we go in with something that we want to know more, we want to know further, then we will ask for the content. Okay? Questions so far? Yeah, maybe Sam, do you yeah. mind? Um, or you can give me, I, I want to go sure. back to that slide on sure. the um, modules, modules uh, before yeah. that. Before, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, okay, this one. Sure. I, I just want to say that. Um, these courses were thought through by us very carefully, the course contents. Um, we know, obviously we are practitioners, we know what are the areas whereby as paralegals uh, in, a, in a law firm, what are the things that you will have to do, right? Our paralegals, what do they do? So we have tailored these modules to directly make you immediately relevant to any law firm looking to hire you. Because if you have gone through these uh, things, you know, I mean, you think what well, preparing bills for taxation, you know, I mean, it's like so special. This is after what happens is for litigation. You, you go to court, you know, lawyers go to court, they fight, they win a case. At the end of the, the, the day, you have to bill the client, right? So what happens is there's this procedure called taxation where you run up, okay, these are all my costs. Of course, if everybody happily pays everything, no need to tax. But most of, quite often, uh, they are saying, no, 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 look, you know, this is not uh, you're charging too much because you're making your opponent pay, the losing opponent pay. So what happens is the court has a system where, okay, fine, you bring this bill to the court to be taxed in by the court. So they will look at it, then they will say, okay, this one fair, this one not fair, you know, strike out, you know, then in the end, the court will make a ruling. All right, uh, this is how much you can charge, then nobody can say anything, right? The judge has ruled. So then you present that bill, the other side has to pay you, the losing side has to pay you. So something like this is um, immediately, you know, if you have learned this and you go into a, you're supporting a litigation department, a dispute resolution department, a law firm. So yeah, I know I do taxation. You know, immediately that puts you ahead of any other applicant who needs to learn on the job. They say, no, I know I do already. It's okay. You know, I come, let me help you. I do prepare all this for you. So the lawyers themselves have to do it. You do it for them, pass it along. Okay, now you go to court, argue why you're doing. But you know, uh, you know, and those of you, for example, who want to be paralegals in intellectual property, IP. That's in this modern world, that's a very, very hot topic. So Rizvi is my partner, uh, who is the head of the IP department. And the kind of work that paralegals do, he know exactly what is needed. Um, IP is an area where you need a lot of paralegal support because you don't always need the lawyers to do it. You know, you're sort of like filing trademark applications, patent applications, you know, all that. Um, a lot of it can be run by the paralegals. So again, you make yourself immediately uh, relevant and useful to either an IP uh, practice or division within a law firm, or there's some specialist IP firms out there who just focus on IP, it says, yeah, I know all about this plug and play. I come in, I can support you straight away. I think that puts you ahead of some others who cover a general kind of course and, and still a lot of OJT necessary. Here, um, this week himself will teach you exactly what you need to know to support an IP team, right? So again, these are, and of course, company and partnership and uh, corporate. In fact, um, Mr. Chu Kok Liang here, sitting here very quietly. Kot Liang is an extremely, extremely experienced company secretary and lawyer, of course, and, and prior to that, he was actually an accountant. So he has seen everything. And he 
uh, used to run the um, uh, corporate secretary of our firm had a huge, huge corporate secretary outfit with very strong uh, um, clients in the public company space. We had a lot of public listed companies who were clients of our corporate secretary unit. And, and uh, Mr. Chu here is actually the company secretary for a lot of a lot of um, public listed companies. So if you go to the annual report, you can see his name, company secretary Chu Kok Liang, that's him. So no better person than for him to teach you if you want to go into, to become a company secretary or to become a chartered secretary, right? Um, he will teach you what you need to know um, so then maybe after that you go and take the exam to be a chartered secretary, you, know? you can ace it. So he comes with a lot of practical experience, particularly advising public listed companies because they have a lot of needs and demands. So my point really here is that um, the courses are all very carefully thought through and tailored to make you immediately useful to your future employer. And, and for some of you who are more entrepreneurial, Maybe after this, you might want to set up your own outfit to provide some of these services. That's also possible. No one has done it yet, you know, by the way, there's nobody that we are aware of. They have set up a paralegal unit, you know, of a company to support law firm. Maybe that's something some of you can think about. Become like, you know, outhouse in, in the house, you know, sort of supporting uh, some of these law firms, you know, at, 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 at a monthly retainer rate. So I think these are intended to uh, give you um, practical and useful knowledge uh, when you're seeking employment, mainly, like, mainly when you're seeking employment with a law firm or wanting to become a practicing company secretary. So, yeah, I just wanted to, sure. to say that. Yeah, sure. thanks. Any questions so far? Well, I think uh, if you are intending to become a paralegal in a law firm or a company secretary, for example, um, uh, yeah, why not? And I, um, okay, I don't ask. Is there, is there any, uh, I mean, uh, is there uh, subject that prepare uh, for foreign as well to open a business in Singapore? I mean, is it practitioner for foreign? I, I think it's agnostic whether you're Singaporean. You don't need the courses do not require you to have any prior knowledge of anything. Not necessary. You don't have to have graduated from one of our local polytechnics or universities or anything at all. You don't even need to have gone through our local education system. It's not necessary. We teach you everything right from the beginning. First topic: legal fundamentals, run by Professor Tan Lee Hong. Okay, all of us here are practitioners except for Professor Tan. She is a professor in the university. So she will teach you the fundamentals that underpins what you need to know for the rest. So we, for that, we got uh, academic to cover that first module. So um, you don't need to come with any prior knowledge. And uh, I think you, know, yeah, you, you might, for example, have a, a niche role to play, sometimes maybe interfacing with people from your home country you have an advantage straight away to everyone else when you speak their language. Because we, we find this, I mean, sometimes, um, like some of the company secretaries, um, say, for example, they come from China. Okay, yeah, they're foreigners, you know, working uh, in, in a corporate secretarial firm. And the Chinese clients love them. Why? Speak their language. Understand how they think. Understand their particular needs. You know, straight away, you know, you interface with them. As opposed to a Singaporean dealing with them, you know, you don't quite get them, they don't get you. And there's this friction. But you know, if you come from that country, you can actually plug into your home country's nationality, maybe even create a pipeline for those people or those companies to come to Singapore. You make yourself very relevant to your employees. Any more questions? Yes. Seems like this class is a new feature in, in, in the area. So when we are doing a retail, we only have a limited space to view. So how are we going to I mean, tackle this area as a legal profession who is teaching only and then we, the 
class who is sitting at the home, maybe there is a destruction or whatever. So how are we? Yeah, I, I, in fact, I was just discussing this just before we started this session. I mean, in terms of the actual um, method of instruction, right? Um, you know, we were talking about whether there, okay, there can basically, be a hybrid. The, there will, might, they might be or might not be a hybrid coming up. But nonetheless, the schedule uh, will be given out. Every learner, will, of course, will be following the schedule on, like what I mentioned just now, the... Uh, the cost timing, right? Uh, it's gonna be seven PM to ten PM. Yeah, I think it's after this, right? Yeah. I think it's yeah. after this, but yeah, it's there's uh I, I saw uh, is it the next one? Okay. No. Okay. Ah, yeah. Yeah. So as you can see, it's every Monday and Thursday. So beforehand, that you're actually given an access to an e-learning system. So in the e-learning system, what is inside the e-learning system? Basically, there's some videos going on. There's some uh, uh, reading materials. There's some Q and A uh, 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 materials inside for you to go through. So when you go through it, you may know the answer, or you may not know, or there's some queries that you brought up along the way. So therefore, the tutoring class that you're going to have just now, as you can see, the breakdown of the class of these 18 hours or 24 hours or so ever, that you're going to spend the time together with the tutors. So during that time, you should be asking the questions or during the time, you should be bringing up the questions that are relevant to your main, maybe your own business, maybe your own work environment in the classroom to make it more relevant. And as a practitioner, uh, tutor as well, able to advise you on a correct path as well, to learn together on a live basis. So this is what TBI and also RHD Academy deliver over to all our adult learners. So to answer that, uh, whether or not, is it a live, is it a Zoom very difficult to, to concentrate or not, right? Is the uh, uh, sessions that you spend together with the tutor that you can ask on an immediate answer basis. Does that, does that? Yeah, you, 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 you might have that point mm. to correctly uh, point out. Mm. But yet, uh, I think that the, the advantage of having a class mm. is much more than a uh, virtual Definitely, definitely. Yeah. The, but so due to the facts, is right now the pandemic is going on, uh, we can't bring it up to the classroom at the moment. So hence, with that, uh, we have to stick with online classes at the moment. In future, after the whole pandemic, uh, probably, you know, face to face, possible for it as well. Yeah, I mean, I I, I do agree that there's certain advantages yeah. with a live. Your tutor is there. Your classroom is there. You're talking the about yourself with yeah. your tutor, with also your fellow classmates to discuss things and all that. There are certain things that a virtual environment cannot replicate, but I mean, we're all doing right. the best we can under the under the current restrictions, I suppose. That's why we, as you as we mentioned, there are a lot of uh, group discussion that we want peer to peer learning as well. We are trying to create the environment where you're able to learn from each other, other than the tutor as well. As well, the tutor will bring in all the life experience and share with you what they have gone through in cases and so forth. Now this is quite sophisticated actually. I mean, I've done some of these myself, been a participant in some of these seminars and all that, where after the main lecture or the main discussion, you actually break out into breakout rooms. Mm -hmm. So there will be breakout rooms set up, you know, where small groups can gather and just four of you or something, five of you will be in one group and discuss and the tutor will move between the rooms. So as I see the tutor's face appearing, you know, on, on screen and he's joining you for maybe 10 minutes. And then, you know, you got any question, you ask him, you give some guidance, then he moves on to another room. All this done virtually. And at the end of, say, half an hour, you know, there'll be a timer that says, okay, another minute left after you all come back into the main room. Yeah, so, so there, are, there are ways nowadays uh, using Zoom yeah. and other programs that can actually recreate almost, uh, almost uh, uh, like a, a, a real learning environment. Another is that uh, 
well, we if you are uh, finishing all the courses itself, uh, I mean it's all the module, nine module of it, then uh, are we able to uh, have a hands on to the legal department, maybe to understand that kind of situation if you are zero kind of uh, background? Okay, uh, part of this whole program, I in fact I, I'm actually Raj from the academy. Um, I'm like overseeing this particular course. Um, now this course is structured such that you know, like what Eugene mentioned earlier, to give people who are fresh. Now because we are fresh, uh, we also, um, as in most companies, even RHD themselves, are also looking for talent, right? So we find that you know you meet what you want. As in when I say we, I'm representing both you know RHD as well as TBI. Um, we have this particular possibility. Now again, we are very selective. But we find that you are suitable, you're qualified, we would like to offer you an internship kind of opportunity. So it's not just you just go to the program and that's it. But then again, we don't want to say it's X number. We want to say one, we don't want to say 10, right? It all depends on each individual trainee's caliber and whether they understand what is being delivered. And of course, also it's very much dependent on all the trainers, what kind of feedback you get. With that, what we want to tell you is that we don't, I mean, uh, I introduce myself as head of Pracademy, all right? It's a very unusual word, Pracademy. Pracademy basically means practice academy. We don't want to just come, for you to just come here, get a paper qualification, but we also want to have some kind of credit experience. So that's what we hope we're able to do. So this whole particular program is structured such that there is an opportunity for internship. Now, it's important that I repeat the word as opportunity for internship. It means it's not guaranteed, it's all depending on how well you cope with the program, how well you do. Um, like what Sam mentioned earlier, there is assessments involved. That means it's not just you go through the course, you know, you get a certificate. It doesn't work that way. There's actually, you know, intensive exam because we also want to test your understanding, you know. So if we want to confirm because they're lawyers, right? They don't just accept anybody. So they will be verifying that. So there's a process involved, there's exams involved, there's studies involved. And if you prove yourself, then I think you can look forward to rewarding new experience, career, and going forward. The most important thing is that you guys will be pioneers in whatever you're doing. Yeah. So that's what I want to get across. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think Raj is actually right in the sense that um because as you can see, all of us um, you know, we are practitioners in our various areas, and you know, we find that you are really quite, you know, you you're really quite good, you know, and that we find that you know you could really help us, you know, in, in what we do, then yes, of course, we would certainly uh, open up an internship position where, you know, you get to sit amongst and work with the lawyers in that particular area um, and um, hone your skills to get practical experience. Um, so that that is, um, in a way, <laughs> we're also looking out for talent, you know. Uh, it's also, in a way, an opportunity for us to sort of um, tap uh, the talent of of um, of um, you know people who come for the course, and um, I mean as with any company, um, the challenge is not just finding people; it's finding the right people. You know, they can be immediately um, value adding to the organization. So um, yeah, certainly as Raj said, um, you know, we also keep an eye out <laughs> for talent. All right. Uh, any further more questions? Um, I just have a question with yeah. what you did earlier. Uh, you mentioned about common law. Yeah. Common law applies to Commonwealth countries. Yeah, pretty much. So where does Hong Kong fit in? Yeah. Does common law is still applied today yeah. or no more? Because China and whatnot. <laughs> no, that is that is a big distinction. Hong Kong is the only common law jurisdiction in the entire Greater China area, okay? Because Macau was a Portuguese, Portuguese yes, yeah. colony. Mm -hmm. So Portugal, being a civil law country, continental Europe, different. Taiwan, different also. Right. Know, for those who think Taiwan should be part of China, not a different topic. But they also follow the civil law. But Hong Kong is, because of the British colony for 150 years, very, very deeply rooted in the common law tradition. Okay. Of course, China has introduced in a certain legislation as it's entitled to, but that's no different from their own legislature introducing legislation, you know, but it doesn't change the fundamental system 
legal system, which is common law, judge-made rules. You know, that's why judges in common law jurisdictions actually um, are quite influential, you know, because they actually make law, you know, um, which is why it's called common law. That's how the term came out, because it's not just the civil law system, it's where everything is in the civil code. Mm -hmm. And it's all about interpreting the civil code of each of the countries. But the common law system, the law is dynamic, it's live, because every case, every unique case that comes before a judge, because a judge of a certain seniority, he rules on it, that becomes part of the body of law. So it's a precedence. It's like it, yes, precedence. That's why in, in a common law jurisdiction, uh, law is built on precedence. You know, that concept is not present in the civil law system. So that's that's the difference, the main distinction. So Hong Kong is still, in case anyone has any doubt, still a common law jurisdiction, at least for the foreseeable future. After 2047, I cannot see. <laughs> as of now, as of now, very much so, very much so. Thank you. Yeah. It still has a very highly respected judiciary. Not to worry, if you still have any other questions, after these sessions, we are still around. Mr. Young is still around, gonna hang around here. Yeah. You can approach yeah, you can, anyone yeah. of us, or Mr. Chu himself, or even Raj himself. You can approach us and to further understand or ask more questions on what you want to get to know. At the same time, right now, do me a favor, do scan over this barcode, give us some feedback on what do you think about this event or this talk of what uh, Mr. Young have just delivered on the corporate company and also partnership so that we can uh, deliver better in the next time round? So right now, we'll end the sessions. So if you want to approach any one of us, please do so. And uh, yep, that's all for today. Thank you very much for your time today. And have a good evening. Thank you very much, Mr. Yang.